Well, this is going to be interesting. I lost my voice already at Gilson Ridge. And I barely have it back here. So we're going to do our absolute best to get through this without sounding like some distorted record. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Galatians chapter 5? And beginning with verse 13, reading through 18, I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of God's word since it's a short reading. This is Paul writing to the church of Galatia. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. You may be seated. From that passage, my text is verse 13. You, my brothers, were called to be free. But I want to refer you back to verse 1 of chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We were called to be free, and we were set free by Christ. But we are not to take that freedom or that liberty and abuse it. Give me liberty or give me death are words <coughs> spoken by Patrick Henry in 1775 as he stood before the Virginia Provincial Convention. He was speaking out against English tyranny. As we are celebrating our 242nd anniversary of independence this week, I wonder what Patrick Henry, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and others of their time would be saying about this country today. They would see legalized murder of the unborn. They would see open practice of hate and anarchy being displayed over the media. They would see the promotion and tolerance of homosexuality. The diminishing of godly influence in public displays and in discourse. When Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, and I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now when we think about what he wrote then with what we have today, do you wonder if he meant all peoples had the right to life. Thank you. If all people had the right to life, as endowed by their Creator, only if the Supreme Court allowed them to be born. As followers of Christ, we should be heartsick. That nine black robed, unelected individuals believe they are empowered to play God. And in good conscience, can they actually believe that only they can decide who may or may not be born? We must pray that the Holy Spirit will convict them of the hardness of their hearts. Our Declaration of Independence guarantees our right to liberty as a nation. 
Christian or not, that liberty falls on everyone in this country. Liberty is ours as the foundation of our country. Every decision made by the government must not infringe on our individual liberties. The pursuit of life and happiness can no longer be infringed by the government. Our Declaration of Independence states that and our Constitution guarantees that. However, we do have those in Washington who believe that's not what it really says. Anybody who's in the military took an oath to defend that Constitution from enemies within or without. And that oath never ceases until we stop breathing. Our politicians need to remember that. Every ex-military man, every current military man who believes in this country, who believes in that oath, I pray would rise up and defend this country against anybody who tries to change it. We have the freedom to make ourselves as successful as we want to be. But it must be in a moral and legal way, without harming our fellow citizens. Now what liberty does a Christian have? God reveals our liberty in His Word. Paul, the writer of this letter to the Church of Galatia, is referring to the freedom from the law of sin and the resulting freedom from sin itself by the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit. We are called to this liberty, this freedom, by God. <clears throat> he has provided a way for us to enjoy this deeper freedom. But this freedom must not be abused. Nor is it to be distorted by man. Or by his desire to be equal with God. The Galatian church was told in verse 13 not to use this liberty for an occasion to the flesh. In other words, don't use your freedom to be selfish. Self, selfishness is the original sin of pride. Thinking that we deserve everything we want. No matter what it costs anybody else. Paul stating to this church here. Do not use your liberty. For an occasion to the selfishness of your heart. Paul wrote basically the same thing to the Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23 and 24, and I quote, and this, I love this verse. I really love this verse. Everything is permissible. And a lot of people stop right there. But he goes on. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. We are free to serve. Well, that doesn't sound right. Pastor, I, 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 I'm free to want. I'm free to get. I'm free to have it given to me. If he has more than I have, I want some of his. We elect a 
at our first socialist in New York just this past week. Got a sit in our Congress. And has already said, wants to change our economic system to a socialist economic system. Just what does this liberty or freedom of faith in Christ mean to us? <clears throat> it means since power is broken, we no longer have to live under its influence. The possibility is available to each to live above sin. Amen. The same divine power that raised Jesus from the grave is able to raise the Christian believer above the world's sin quagmire. We just don't try hard enough. Or we don't ask hard enough. We don't pray hard enough. We choose to wallow in this quagmire. And we have no need to if we believe in Jesus Christ. The power that is available to us is the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Now last week I told you that the Holy Spirit was the seal God puts upon the believer. And that on that seal He puts... His name of the product. He's the maker. And it says God's child. Well, if I'm God's child and He gave me the Holy Spirit and sealed me for the great promise and He has power endued with that Holy Spirit, why in the world are we living in sin's quagmire? To abuse this freedom that Christ has won for us is to live for total self. Seeking our own will for our lives instead of yielding to God's will. God's word tells us we can't just do what our flesh wants us to do. The Apostle Paul and Peter, in their writings, always add to their statements of the believer's freedom the words to serve or servant. Serve one another or be a servant one to another, but always seek the good of others. Put yourself last. We have a plethora of politicians who don't know that truth. They put themselves ahead of everybody else. Now God provides for us this freedom from sin. And yet that liberty that he has given to us had a very high price. We are now called, as believers, to be slaves to the spirit of love. If you look at verse 14 and verse 16, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, Love your neighbor as yourself. So I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Or in other words, you will not gratify the desires of self. Verse 15, stuck right in the middle. Of course, 14, 15, 16. You understood that, I'm sure. But 15 is our warning. Paul says, watch 
out. If we do not submit or surrender to the Spirit of God, we will destroy ourselves and one another. He's talking about the church. If the church is not fully surrendered, fully committed, fully yielded to the Holy Spirit of God, we will destroy ourselves and His church. Self would be in control. And if self is in control, self will decide what is right or wrong. God will be dismissed from all practices of life and decisions for that life. We will have what we have right now. Well, it might be wrong for you, but it's okay for me. And I don't care what it does to you. That's the mindset of the world. Get what I can get. Fooey on you. Now, I'm sure they use a little stronger language there. But <clears throat> I won't do that in mixed company. We have man disavowing God. We have man dismissing God. We have man outlawing God. We have man taking authority over life itself. This will destroy us as one nation under God unless we start to change it now. I really personally believe that abortion and the blood of all those murdered unborn will break the back of this nation if we do not change our ways and seek the forgiveness of God. If you read the Old Testament, and you read about the God of Moloch, where the Israelites sacrificed their children to the fires of Moloch. And God said, this is an abomination to me. It's not that far a stretch to say, well, abortion is the same thing. Our founding fathers knew that if God was not remaining in the center of this country and all of its choices, because it was revealed to them, a lot of them were Christian, a lot of them were questionable Christians, but yet they all went to church whatever they believed. <clears throat> they knew who God was. They understood who God was. And they believed that God revealed to them, this is the only way democracy is going to work. God must remain the anchor of this nation. He has to be the center. His word has got to be the foundation of all of our laws. God knows what's right and wrong. And we shouldn't try to dismiss him as archaic or unknowing or old-fashioned. His spirit must permeate the hearts and minds of all men that we would further a society of benevolence, care, and love for our fellow man. The condition of our world right now is such that very few of us even know anything about our neighbors. Because 
we don't want to get involved in their lives and they, we don't want them involved in our lives. So how can we be benevolent to one another if we don't even know what they need or they know what we need? God does not want us to become closed up to a self-sufficient, dying religion. He wants us to be alive in the Spirit of Christ. And He wants the Spirit of Christ to pour out His godly love through us to all people. <laughs> If we serve one another instead of take from one another, we will find that we will no longer be taking advantage of one another. Never slighting or denying one group that another may prosper at the expense of the other's liberty. We are called to liberty. Through the cross of Christ. We have been set free from sin by the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus. And to remain free or liberated, we must voluntarily become slaves to love. Agape love. Having a benevolent desire for the well-being of others. The way Christ loved and served others. He's our prime example of the being of God. We are to allow Christ to love through us. This life of liberty and love is not brought about by works. We cannot earn it. It is not brought about by legalism. We can't deny certain things and think we're going to be okay with God. We cannot do it through routine rituals or externals, you know. We have to look a certain way. Fifty, sixty years ago, all you ladies would have to get rid of all your makeup and all your jewelry. And you'd all have to have floor-length dresses with high button collars and long sleeves. That's externals. Because you look holy, they say you are holy. Well, that's a bunch of punk. And self-denial, self-piety. It's a, oh, I can't do that. Look at me. Look what I'm doing. Oh, no, that's, that's not the way it should be. I, I'm not worthy. Look at me. Look at me. That's self-piety. I want to look a certain way like I am very humble before God, but I want you to see me be that way. And that's not the way God wants it. God says, whatever you do, do it in secret. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. In other words, be humble within yourself before God and leave it at that. The only way this life of liberty and love comes about in any believer is by the Holy Spirit and it's by faith. You see, God gives nothing to us that we work for. All the good stuff God gives to us, He gives to us to accept from Him, to trust Him with it by faith. Faith means I trust God. What he said is true. 
If God says, I'm free, I take it by faith. If he says, I'm forgiven, I take that by faith. If he says, I give you my gift of the Holy Spirit, I take that by faith. And then I see if he's working in me. And if he's not working in me, I got to go back to square one to start over. Until the life and heart of every believer are fully surrendered and remain continually surrendered to the Holy Spirit, we as believers are in danger of being capable are not being capable of Christ-like love. And that's what God wants. He wants the love of Christ, the ministry of Christ, to continue through us, who He has redeemed. And if we're not continually surrendered, constantly surrendered, fully surrendered, we're incapable of doing that. Because we cannot conjure up from within ourselves anything that even simulates the love of Christ. The only thing that matches the love of Christ is the love of Christ that He gives us and flows through us. If we lose our liberty, each will be in bondage to sin again. Think about that. Remember the parable of the house that was cleaned of all the varmints and the dirt and dust and nobody moved in and all of a sudden all the varmints came back seven times worse? That's what will happen to us if we are not surrendered to the Holy Spirit. We are in danger of being in bondage to sin again, and this time it will be worse. If we are no longer in step with the Spirit's guidance, if we are without the Spirit's control, and without the flesh and self crucified in Christ, we will have those sinful desires stifle the glory of Christ being revealed in our lives. His love not in us. His life not in us. You see, folks, salvation is a free will choice of all. God will permit us to choose hell. He'll, he doesn't force us to take heaven. He'll let us choose hell. He wants us to choose Christ, and then we'll do all that he can to reveal himself to each of us through Christ. But here's the catch. Holiness of heart in, and life is not an option for the believer. <coughs> the scriptures say, be holy. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. You must keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. <coughs> and if we as believers refuse, we open ourselves to renewed bondage to sin. Now why must we love as Christ loved? Jesus said, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love. The law is fulfilled by love. Love is the Holy Spirit's fruit. 
The Holy Spirit can only manifest Christ's love when control of the heart is His. And when it is His, 